This video is based on the book Habits of Highly Effective Countries by Leon Lowe. While originally produced for South Africa, its principles can be applied everywhere. It asks the policymakers question, what must policymakers do to make their countries successful? When policymakers ask which policies coincide with which outcomes, they seldom get accurate answers. They are bombarded with biased advice, but seldom get objective and reliable information. Policymakers should have information that enables them to make good decisions based on unbiased statistical evidence. These are some of the questions to which they need answers. Why are some countries rich and others poor? What explains high and low levels of crime and corruption? What factors allow citizens to live longer and healthier lives? What makes some third world countries prosperous while others remain poor? Why do poor people risk their lives to get into countries whose governments don't want them? Do labor laws benefit people with jobs at the expense of the unemployed? And does foreign aid promote development? One of the few helpful options in seeking answers to these questions is to make international comparisons to determine not only what others do, but whether what they do actually succeeds. Policymakers need information that enables them to emulate proven successes, anticipate pitfalls, and avoid failure. Information that will help them make theirs a highly effective country. This video describes a method for obtaining that vital information. We start by asking what correlates with what? Simply, the good things in the world, what, what do they coincide with? More housing, more literacy, cleaner environment, less crime, less child abuse, less infant mortality, higher life expectancy, whatever it is. What do these things coincide with in the world? And it's a statistical question. It could be environment, could be culture, could be race, could be history, were you or weren't you colonized, economic policy, what political system are you... Are you Islamic? Are you Jewish? Are you Christian? Whatever, what, what makes the difference? And that is that everything that governments want to achieve, including our government, basically is achieved most where there's most wealth. Now, you might think, well, that's obvious. Rich countries or rich people have more of things you want, right? Rich countries have more literacy, cleaner air, whatever. That doesn't automatically follow. Some of you that have studied, for example, other social sciences than economics, economists tend to think more wealth makes everything better, but that's not necessarily true of others. In fact, the established view in academic circles is that more wealth or higher economic growth is actually bad in many ways. It causes uh, more inequality, environmental degradation, uses up resources, causes psychological alienation, uh, labor conflict, labor versus capital, and so on. So that was itself an interesting finding. If you say, where do you have the highest literacy, the least crime, the cleanest environment, the safest working conditions, the highest life expectancy, and for that matter, the, the most sustainable use of natural resources, what you find is it's in countries that are rich. Richer countries have more of everything. For example, wealthier is more literate, wealthier is more developed, the so-called United Nations Development Index, uh, Human Development Index, HDI. Uh, wealthier is cleaner, more sanitized water, and even there are now various happiness indices. And what you find quite interesting is that happiness increases as countries get richer, and then when they're very, very rich, when people are stinking rich, uh, then and it seems as if you get even more rich, you might become slightly less happy. But nonetheless, for all of us in the world, we've got a long way to go for most of us, I should imagine, to become wealthier is to become happier. So we came up with a stylized graph that basically says everything is better where people are wealthier. These are the per capita GDPs of countries of the world, and basically almost everything you look at is better in richer countries. So the issue then becomes how do you become wealthy? How to get the economy to grow is basically this. You leave it alone, Less free economies, these are the world's countries, all the countries for which figures are available, divided into what are called quintiles, five groups, with freer economies there and less free economies here. By the way, these are 
free economies, not free countries. This is not talking about political or democratic freedom or civil liberties. It's talking about the economic system. Richer countries have freer economies. Now, this doesn't tell you why they become rich. This could just mean that when countries are rich, they free up their economy. And so the important thing is to say, how do they grow? What makes countries grow? And the answer to that is that unfree economies on average contract, free economies on average grow. Now, those of you who studied economics or read a little bit about political science will remember the saying that the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. So Karl Marx was right. Karl Marx was wrong about one small detail, which is that the rich get richer because they don't do what he recommended and the poor get poorer because they do. So worldwide, this is what happens. Basically, freer economies get richer, Richer economies have all of the things that policymakers want to achieve in a country, almost all of them. An important one for us in South Africa, for example, is equality. So there's a thing called the poverty index in the world. And there you find, again, that poverty is virtually eradicated in free economies and predominant in less free economies. This is the so-called Gini coefficient, the standard way that economists measure inequality. Uh, basically, what it says is that at 100, or 1, this could be 0 to 1, or 0 to 100, at 1, uh, all of the wealth would be in the hands of one single person, and at 0, everyone will be exactly equal. That's really what this index is telling you. And what you can see is, again, that freer economies which are richer economies, which are economies growing at higher rates, actually have more economic equality, more equality. So even equality, you get more of where things are left to the market. That's not obvious. Then there was the issue of the income gap. What happened is that we kept hearing that as these countries went through these fantastically long periods of high economic growth, the income gap was getting bigger. This was a big concern, the income gap. Now, that was fascinating because, uh, you know, this was very distressing. In America, for example, the gap between the rich and the poor was getting bigger when the country was getting richer. Very distressing thought, and one wondered, what can one do about this? And, of course, in America, as here, that has a racial implication. Not everywhere, but in America, it happens to become a white-black issue. Uh, in countries with one race, it's, that's not the issue. And often the white-black issue is, 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 is a confused with simply rich and poor. But nonetheless, in America, the idea was blacks were getting poorer and whites were getting richer. What was clear is that the black people, the poor areas of America, are much, much wealthier. It's actually quite astonishing. And I thought, that's interesting, but all the literature tells us they're poorer, and there they are, very obviously much richer. So I needed to understand what that was, and we looked at the figures. And the question was, were the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer? And why was the income gap going? And the answer turns out to be, no, the rich were getting richer and the poor were getting richer faster. Now, how can that be? And it's very easily demonstrated by simple arithmetic. If you imagine a rich person with 10,000 and a poor person with $100 rands, it doesn't matter, at the beginning of a period, it doesn't matter how long the period is for this exercise, and you say to yourself, if you both become 10% richer, what happens at the end of the period? Well, the result is the rich person goes to 11, the poor person to 110, and then you say to yourself, what happens to the gap? Well, the gap gets bigger. At both of them growing at 10% of 10,000 is more than 10% of 100, therefore the gap gets bigger. So then the question is, well, at what rate would the poor person have to get richer for the gap not to grow? This is roughly the sort of ratio, by the way, between the richest and the poorest 10% in most societies, this ratio of 10,000 to 100. What would happen is that the poor person would have to get richer at 1,000% if the rich person get richer at only 10% for the gap to stay the same. So it turns out that during periods of high economic growth, the rich get richer and the poor get richer faster, and then there's this arithmetic illusion that the gap appears to get bigger, but it's actually irrelevant. What you should be worried about is, are the poor getting richer? And the answer is, yes, they are. And this is what happens if you grow fast or slow. South Africa, for the last generation, since 1970, South Africa has basically stagnated. The average South African 
is now about the same wealth as the average South African was when most South Africans now living weren't even born. That's a scary thought. The economy has stagnated since then. If you grow at the rates that actual economies in the world are growing, this is what happens. You can see that within, for starting where we are now, within 20 years, that's just slightly more than twice as long as we've had since transition, South Africa could go, if we grow at the rates of high growth economies, from being a relatively poor country, a developing country, to being one of the wealthiest countries on earth. It's very quick. Well, we looked at what's happened in the world, and these are all the countries in the world for which the figures are available, comparing South Africa with them, and you can see South Africa's growth rate on average over the past 5, 10, and 20 years, essentially stagnating, and our rank in terms of where we were in the world, and you can see over here what happened in the past five years, the three highest growth countries in the world, the past 10 and the past 20. Now, what's significant here is that the only country that appears in all three groups is Ireland. In other words, it has had the most consistent high growth of any country in the world. One of our neighbors, Botswana, is the second highest sustained growth rate of all countries in the world. And between Botswana and Mozambique, could we get Zimbabwe, which is the fastest declining economy in the world. So we have virtually the fastest growing and the fastest declining economy right on our border. Now what that tells you is there's nothing special about Africa. That African countries can be the world's winners or losers like any other country in the world depending on what policies they follow. This shows you how important capital formation is, savings. And this shows you that the income of workers is directly relevant to how much is invested in employing them by the employers, capital. So what's not associated with economic growth? Economic freedom, we saw, brings about growth. Well, what doesn't? Now, this is itself interesting. Remember, we looked at the losers as well as the winners. We wanted to know, or the ANC wants to know, what does the government have to change to be more like winners and less like losers? Now, being not like a loser is as important in being like a winner in your field too. And so we looked at what the losers do. Now, there's some interesting ones. For example, many of us would have assumed that education is important. And education budgets in the world do not coincide with higher economic growth. Uh, and what you must maybe think of education as, therefore, is something like housing. It's one of the things you can have when you grow. If you become wealthy, you can afford education. Aid is an interesting one, foreign aid. Now, the interesting thing is, firstly, Africa now as a continent is growing very fast. Some of the countries are amongst the highest growth countries in the world. And yet, everyone wants to give Africa aid. And this is what happens to the countries that get aid, that the highest aid countries have the lowest growth on average, and the lowest aid countries have the highest growth. And the reason is probably really quite simple if you think about it. What is aid? Aid is government to government money that goes from governments of rich countries to governments of poor countries. In other words, what they're saying is if you manage to keep your people poorer than you do, then we will give you more money. It's a reward for causing poverty. The evidence shows that foreign aid does not make poor countries richer. In fact, as we have noted, there is no evidence at all that aid helps poor countries escape poverty. The statistical evidence shows that the prosperity of a country is determined by one thing and one thing alone, and that is the policies implemented by its government. Rich countries wanting to help poor countries must do so in ways that encourage recipient governments to adopt policies that correlate with prosperity. Using aid for establishing state industries or increasing the size of the civil service has proved to be counterproductive. Governments of developing countries should rather leave business to private enterprises and increase the ease of doing business by reducing government regulation. This is an interesting one. And the truth is that governments who tax more don't in fact damage their economies and have less growth. But what matters is really how they spend the money. Not how much they take, but what they do with it. And if they do, if they spend the money by getting involved in peristatals, these kinds of investments by government tend not only just to run at losses, permanently then have to be subsidized, but they always come along with protection to keep out more efficient, more dynamic private competitors. So government investment in the economy 
tends to coincide with low economic growth or poor performance, and government over-regulation of the economy coincides with poor growth. So what government should do once it's taken the money is basically give the money to needy people, welfare, education, health care, infrastructure development, whatever it might be. Another big question is, is there a poor country disadvantage? Do, do poor countries, Africa is the poorest continent on earth, the only continent that's been getting poorer for the last 30 years, our country has stagnated. Does that mean we're at a disadvantage? Well, the answer is government policy can make poor countries catch up with rich countries very fast in as little as 20 or 30 years and government policy can cause poor countries to crash. So we do have on our borders again high growth Botswana, low growth Zimbabwe as a direct re response to the policies that the governments of these two countries adopt. Then there is what we call the acceleration effect. This is quite interesting. Economic freedom coincides with higher growth. And what we found was interesting. We couldn't understand why countries like China and India and other countries in Africa, Mozambique, Tanzania, Botswana, which have relatively unfree economies, and remember unfree economies are usually associated with low economic growth, how come they were growing so fast? More important than the economic system is the change. In which direction is your country reforming? If the country moves in the right direction towards the policies associated with prosperity, you get immediately and quickly rewarded. High economic growth follows, jobs creations follow, investment follows, everything gets better. So if we do nothing, our economy will grow slowly. That's what the world's experience tells us. On the other hand, if we have less economic freedom, which we had this year for the first time, by the way, every year up to now since transition, our economy has been getting freer. This year for the first time, we slipped a little. What the world's experience tells us is that's quite serious. We can't go far. If we slip, we'll actually start crashing. Now, what's the bottom line? Having told you, we then looked at the, what are the characteristics of the world winners and losers. This is then what it all boils down to. These are the bottom lines. These are the characteristics of the world's winners, policies, impartial courts, judicial independence, credit market regulations, very re deregulation, and so on. I won't go into what all of these are, but you can see South Africa already leads the world. We have a better score in the things associated with being a winner than the top 20 performers in the world. This is where we're already better than they are. So when our minister Trevor Manuel says the fundamentals are in place, this is correct. We have already some of the fundamentals, the things you have to do to be a winner. We're already better than the winners. Now that's very, very good news, very exciting news. This is also, this is the percentage we lead the world's top 20 performers. So we lead them, and this is a color-coded idea of what these all relate to. Some of them relate to trade, regulation, finance, and the red ones relate to the rule of law. Now please note how many red ones there are because I'm going to come back to that. This then is where we lag. This is where South Africa is behind. Note crime, by the way, is the top of the list. Now that's not our choice. I'm not one of these people who carries on about crime, but it simply is the statistic where we differ most from the world's winners is in the crime rate or law and order, uh, which is a component of the rule of law. So we did very well, you will recall. We be beat the world in most of the rule of law indices, but one of them, the crime rate, we're a disaster compared to the world's winners. Foreign exchange restrictions, Transfers and subsidies, that's taxes, where, by the way, it's, remember I said it doesn't matter how high you tax, it matters what you spend the tax on. And we're not spending it in, in the way that richer countries spend it, which is more on welfare and less on government involvement in the economy. Centralized bargaining, the famous labor issue, the, one of the serious ones, is that freer and richer economies have less labor market control. Time spent with bureaucracy is red tape. The amount of red filling in forms, submitting forms, keeping records, all of that are characteristics of where we in South Africa are, have a bad score. We have a bad score on foreign trade, on foreign exchange controls, and on our control of inflation, a high level of what's called inflation variability. So in short, these are the things where it's a short list, that's all there is, in the longer list is where we're already better than the top 20, 
And this is where we are worse than the top 20 and what we would have to change if we want to be a higher performing nation. Now you can summarize all this into these. Basically what you can see is that we're already in the lead and should increase our lead in these areas. This is consolidating all of them into, into single headings. And in these areas, rule of law, foreign exchange, time with bureaucracy, centralized labor bargaining, and shifting spending from economic activity to welfare would be the things we would have to do in South Africa to be more like winners and less like losers. I did say I would add something about the rule of law. Remember how the rule of law is so critical. Now, the rule of law, very few people know what it means. It means a separation of powers. Legislators legislating, the executive implementing, and the judiciary adjudicating. And the rule of law is due process, proper rights of appeal, legal certainty, and much more. But let's look at this quickly. Rule of law and corruption. High levels of corruption where you don't have the rule of law. Uh, income, richer people where there is the rule of law. More investment where there's the rule of law. And this shows you the differences in equality, that the rule of law coincides with more equality. Child labor, whatever you look at, the rule of law, political stability, unemployment is what you want. That then brings me to the end of the presentation. To summarize, we wanted to find out what policies winning nations follow to achieve success. In other words, what are the habits of highly effective countries? We examined the policies followed by the 20 most successful and the 20 least successful countries. From the results, we can tell what policies to emulate and what to avoid. One of the most striking findings was that wealthy nations have more of everything. They have higher literacy, greater human development, safer water, better sanitation, better health, more of everything, including happiness. High economic growth is therefore what poor countries need most. How is this to be achieved? Our study shows that freer economies have higher growth rates, less poverty, less inequality, higher per capita income, better on all the most important measures. However, that does not tell us what a country must do to become a winning nation. The 2020 analysis provides the answer. South Africa, for instance, is doing better than the top 20 growth countries in some ways, but lags in a few very important areas. We must maintain and increase our strength and improve the areas in which we lag the winning nations. The 2020 analysis tells us South Africa can become a high growth winning nation if we drastically reduce the crime rate, entirely abolish exchange controls, significantly free up the labor market, meaningfully reduce business regulation, and control the level and variability of inflation. Becoming a winning nation is a matter of policy choice, not a matter of destiny.